on Saturday, January 4th, I went with the youth group to Vassalette Shrine in Attleboro, Massachusetts to see their Festival of Lights. If you've never been to the Festival of Lights at Vassalette, I highly recommend it because from the day after Thanksgiving through the oh, days of Christmas, their 10-acre property is covered with over 300,000 lights. It's truly a sight to behold. So as we were making our way to Alboro, I must confess that I was really not that excited. That morning we had a casual rehearsal, and then I had some meetings in the afternoon, and then we were off to La Salette, and in the morning we were our pageant that next morning, and I thought to myself, what was I thinking? <laughs> and to top it all off, January 4th this year was just a rainy and dreary day. It's so like, great, I'm going to hang out with our middle school students in rain, walking through these lights. Good job, Dante. <laughs> so we arrived at Lasalette, and the benefit, I will say, of going to Lasalette after Christmas Day is that there are no crowds. So we drove right in and, and parked and found our way to this outdoor nativity chapel where one of my colleagues who brought her youth group this year um, gave me the heads up and said, they do a prayer service and then turn the lights on. So we find our way, we pray with the folks at Lasalette, and then we're directed to turn around, and in an instant, the dreariness of that late afternoon and early evening was gone, and 300,000 lights were illuminated. It was, at least for me, a moving and powerful experience that made me stop and think, so maybe it wasn't so bad to come here this day. Because what I realized as we were walking through La Salette, as members of our youth group and their parents were, were walking up those pilgrim steps and praying, as we walked around looking at icons, as, as the choristers and the youth group were singing the hymns that we were singing the next morning at the pageant, I thought this is a wonderful transitional moment. In these final hours of Christmas time, leading us to the epiphany. Because the epiphany and the season after, which is where we are now, are all about the revelations of God. And on that night, as those lights turned on, I saw a bit of that revelation. Revelation about light casting out darkness, about light casting out gloominess. Revelation of the joy of young people singing songs of praise, about looking and deciphering, do you know what this icon means? Trying to figure out the stories and the elements of our narrative of salvation. It was a great way to lead into the pageant the next morning and the Feast of the Epiphany on Monday and these Sundays beyond, because what all of these days are about, are about revelation, about revealing God, revealing God's self to us, and about our ministry and work being revealed to us as well. So we start with that Feast of the Epiphany, that day when the Magi arrive at the Christ Church. Day. And that story is so important for us because it lets us know that the work God is at doing in the world is not just for some people. It's not just for one group of people, but it's for all the world. And so that first mark, that first mark of Revelation to us is about the expansiveness of God. That God's love is truly for all people. On that second Sunday after the Epiphany, that first Sunday, rather, the first Sunday after the Epiphany, we marked the baptism of our Lord. If you were here at the 1015 service that day, you saw that joyful experience as we baptized four individuals into the household of God. That day when Jesus' his own ministry is inaugurated, that day when the voice speaks from heaven, when Jesus emerges out of the waters, this is my Son and my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. On that first Sunday after the Epiphany, that second step in the revelation of God lets us know that each and every one of us is beloved 
to each and every one of us, God says, you are my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The stories continue, and actually those early days, throughout the middle of this month, we had a couple of important holy days in the calendar of the church. Last Saturday was the Feast of the Confession of St. Peter. It's that day where we don't remember Peter's martyrdom, but we remember his life and ministry. We remember his confession, not confession of sin, but confession of faith. When Peter, that great disciple, said to, the, to Jesus, to the others around him, when Jesus asked that question, who do you say that I am? It's Peter who says, you are the Messiah. And so on, on January 18th, we remember that confession of Peter. And I think that's that third piece of revelation for us. We begin with the revelation of the expansiveness of God's work, the revelation of our belovedness, and that third revelation starts to speak to our ministry. A ministry to proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah. And then yesterday was also a holy day in the calendar of the church. Book ending the confession of Peter, we have the conversion of St. Paul. Paul, that great apostle to the Gentiles, whose public ministry doesn't start out so great. Before his conversion experience, he's known as Saul, and he's out persecuting the early followers of Jesus. And then, as he's traveling with that road to Damascus, a blinding light appears. The best of the Lord says to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute? Saul's knocked off his horse, he's blinded, and that's that converting moment for him. And he goes forth from that place, his sight is restored, his name is changed, and he becomes that great disciple to the Gentiles. With the expansiveness of God, the inclusion of all people in God's work, we have the claiming of each and every one of us as beloved, we have our call to confess our faith, and our call to conversion of life. Let go of all those things that prevent us from being fully who God has called us to be, all of those things that separate us from one another and from God, to let those things go and to turn back towards God. These are those early marks of revelation for us in these first Sundays after the Epiphany. And as I think about our life as a parish, I think there are excellent things for us to be mindful of, particularly on this day. When we gather our 745 congregation, our, our 1015 congregation to worship together at 9 a.m. Because today is annual meeting Sunday. The day when we gather to celebrate and give thanks for all that has been happening in this past year in our life together and to look forward to what is to come in this year ahead. For me, annual meeting Sunday for us is a joyous and wonderful occasion, and it is own marker of revelation. This day is the time for us to see how God has been revealed among us in this place, and it's a moment for us to seek out that revelation, to seek out the, the clearness of what our call is to be God's people in the year ahead. I was struck yesterday morning by the choice of brother yes a word. The Society of St. John, the evangelist, is a monastic community in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, in the Invisible Church, and one of their daily offerings is something called Brother Give Us a Word. Every day of the week, except for Sundays, they send out a word with a few sentence definition, a, a meditation written by one of the brothers. And yesterday's meditation struck me as fitting for an annual meeting Sunday. Brother Keith Nelson chose the word illumination. And here's what he wrote. The light of epiphany can illuminate gently, conveniently, casting a beam precisely where we need it. But it can also knock us off our horses, as it did to St. Paul on the road to Damascus. You might need a moment to be still, and allow your eyes to adjust that what blinded you was in fact the dazzling light of a new and unexpected sunrise. As we gather on this annual meeting Sunday, I feel as if we are in the midst of that 
new and unexpected sunrise. That epiphany light has shined on this place, illuminating this place, calling us to be God's people, setting us on that road for the year ahead. As we look forward to 2020 in our community life, it will be a time of great and exciting things. It will be a time of new beginnings and also a time of some endings. 2020 for us might be a time of maybe a little anxiety about what the future brings, but it is rooted in hope that God continually works powerfully amongst us and in this place. So as we launch out on this new year, I hope we will continue to seek out for how God is revealed among us, that we will look out for all of those activities that happen each and every day, those gentle illuminations and those shocking ones that knock us off our horses. Because be they gentle or shocking, they all provide a gift to us, that gift of dazzling light, of that new and unexpected something.